see him. I want, yep. That was a treat. I got to hear him the other evening when they were practicing, and then John and I had to leave, and Steve was going to stay and sing some more. I would like to have stayed, but uh, they did a beautiful job on that song. Today we're going to look at the Old Testament book, Obadiah. It's sort of like uh, shepherds. If you're not careful, you'll miss it. You'll drive right by it and wonder where you have been. But uh, Obadiah is one of the minor prophets. It's right after the book of uh, Amos and right before the book of Jonah. And so hopefully uh, you can find it there. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. It's only one chapter, so it's probably about one page in your Bible. We're going to be looking the next two weeks, the first few verses today, then we'll finish it out uh, next week. And so Obadiah, beginning in verse 1, the vision of Obadiah, this is what the Lord God has said about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord, an envoy has been sent among the nations. Rise up and let us go to war against her. Look, I will make you insignificant among the nations. You will be deeply despised. Your arrogant heart has deceived you, you who live in clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there will I bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. If thieves came to you, if marauders by night, how ravaged you would be. Wouldn't they steal only what they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, wouldn't they leave some grapes? How Esau will be pillaged, his hidden treasures searched out. Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. Those who eat bread with you will set a trap for you. He will be unaware of it. In that day, this is the Lord's declaration, will I not eliminate the wise ones of Edom and those who understand from the hill country of Esau? Teman, your warriors will be terrified so that everyone from the hill country of Esau will be destroyed by slaughter. Let us join together in prayer. Father, as we open your word today, this prophecy issued some 2,500 years plus ago. We see, Lord, today how it applies to us, not just our nation, but, Lord, to the church and to us as individuals. I pray your Spirit would allow us to be able to apply this word. Lord, you know the danger whenever we look and we might judge a people in the past or we might begin to categorize groups apart from us. Lord, help us to draw a circle around ourselves and apply this truth to our hearts, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the many poignant parables in the Bible was told by Nathan to King David. You may remember it. He gave this story to David to teach David a truth about David after David committed the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. But in the parable that uh, Nathan told David, he told of a rich man who had vast wealth and many possessions, uh, very large flocks and herds. In contrast to that, there was a poor man who had only one tiny ewe lamb that he bought and that he cared greatly for. This poor man treated the lamb like a child. Well, one day, a traveler came to the rich man, and desiring to prepare a meal for the traveler, instead of drawing from his vast herds and flocks, the rich man went to the poor man, took that precious ewe lamb from him, had the lamb slaughtered, and provided the meal for the traveler. Now, you can imagine how you would feel after hearing the story, but when David heard that story, the Scripture says that he was indignant, and he said, that man should die for what he did to the poor man. And at that moment, Nathan turned to David, and he said, you are the man. And in that moment, David was able to draw the truth uh, from that parable and understand that even though he could have had almost any woman in the kingdom, he sinned in taking one honorable man, Uriah's wife. This morning, we're going to be looking at Obadiah. 
And the danger that we can face whenever we look at the Old Testament prophecies is we can begin to say, yes, they did wrong. And we can begin to heap up and all of these accusations and we can begin to judge them. It's so easy in human nature to judge the motives and the action of others, but it's very difficult when we have to judge our own. And so we learn that from the parable, but also we learn from this parable that Nathan told David a very important truth, that whenever we look at the narrative material or the accounts in Scripture, we should always be looking with an attitude, God, what do you have to say about me? God addressed this prophecy, as I said, over 2,500 years ago to Edom. And it's easy for us to see Edom's transgressions. We're going to see this week four clear transgressions of Edom. And, and I'm going to be honest because I've studied this book before and I was studying again in the past couple of weeks. It is also very easy and it will be very easy as we go through this to see how the United States of America sort of parallels Edom in these particular transgressions. And so it's easy for us to say, yes, not only Edom has done wrong, but God, we see where the United States has done wrong. But I appeal to you today. While it's easy to say bad Edom or bad United States of America, it's not often easy to say I'm the person. And so I pray today God will speak to us individually. Franklin Graham recently said of our nation, we've not only taken God out of our country, but out of our lives. What does he mean? It's not just a nationwide thing, but it actually begins personally. We're beginning this two-week look in the book of Obadiah. It is the shortest book in the Old Testament, 21 verses. And while many of the Old Testament prophets speak against numerous nations, Obadiah speaks against one nation. That nation is Edom. Edom was subject to more prophetic judgments than any other people group in the Old Testament. In fact, the book of Psalms, Isaiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Amos, Malachi, Jeremiah, and Obadiah, all eight speak at some point in their letter or in their book words of judgment against Edom. Now, who were the Edomites? The Edomites were descendants of Esau. You remember Jacob and Esau. You remember the rivalry. You remember how even before they were born, God decided and determined that Jacob would be blessed. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And you may remember the account that, that uh, Jacob, in a way, in a very real way, deceived uh, both Esau and his father to gain the birthright and the blessing. And you could realize as you read that the animosity between the two, but in a beautiful picture of reconciliation and as a credit to Esau, before the two of them died, they made their peace. They came together. Esau was forgiving uh, toward his brother uh, Jacob, and Jacob also was very humble in how he approached his brother. But the problem is Esau's descendants did not follow the example of their forefather Esau. In fact, throughout Old Testament history, Edom was often indifferent to and sometimes even antagonistic toward Israel. In fact, its mistreatment of the nation of Israel is one of the primary reasons that God was going to judge uh, Edom. We're going to look at that aspect of their transgression more next week. But today I want to focus on four areas of misplaced trust for Edom. And as we look at that, hopefully we'll evaluate our own lives as we ask God the question, am I like Edom? God, where am I placing my trust? I challenge us today to look at our own lives and to be honest with ourselves, upon whom or upon what am I depending? There were four things on which Edom depended that did not please God. None of the four included God. 
So after looking at these four things, I want to draw another Old Testament illustration and then look at this first part of Obadiah in light of our own lives. But the first thing we see this morning, Edom depended upon its location. Where it was located geographically, there's an insert in the bulletin, and you can note that on that insert, Edom is sort of to the right in the upper third of the map. You may want to look at it later. It was below Moab. It was southeast of the promised land. The print is really too light for you to see, but the original, and by the way, the book from which I copied it gives free copy, free rights to reprint that, and so I said, well, I'm going to do it. And in the original depicts the mountainous terrain. It's probably hard for you to see. But Edom was located in mountainous territory. I was traveling with friends in Karen the other day. We were heading up to see the beautiful sights. And as we were driving, we, driving, we saw this driveway that went way up or way down depending whether they were coming or going from this house. And we all agreed that isn't a place you want to be living in icy weather. Moab would not have been a place that was good for icy weather, or Edom rather. But Edom was ideally situated militarily. It was situated on the high grounds. It was situated within the clefts of the rocks. They were protected, they were shielded, and they could see any threat of attack. Not only were, uh, did their geographical location give the advantage of looking down upon anyone who would seek to impose upon them, but also it was very difficult terrain for those who would attack them to navigate. Notice what Obadiah says in verse 3. Your arrogant heart has deceived you. Who is that? Edom. You who live in the clefts of the rock, shielded, you think, protected. In your home, on the heights, looking down from a position of, of, of superiority over those who would attack you. Who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? In verse 4, God basically says, I will bring you down. You see, Edom placed its trust in its secure location. And I'll be honest, as I read this, I began to think about our United States. There's never been a world power more secure geographically. Two vast oceans to the east and the west. Benevolent neighbors to the north and the south. I think of that tiny nation of Israel, and they're surrounded with people of conflict. But we are really located geographically by the grace of God in what may, is not, no debate the most secure nation geographically. But we see here the sin of Edom was they led their security to become a false sense of security. They were neglecting God. Edom depended upon its location. But I want you to see, secondly, Edom also depended upon its military. We see that in verse 9. Teman, your warriors will be terrified. Now, Teman was a city in southeast Edom. It would be like calling Jerusalem when you're speaking to Judah. So speaking of Teman was like speaking to Edom. And, and although it was just one city in Edom, it represented all of Edom. And so basically what he's saying is Edom, marked by this city, your warriors, your elite troops will be terrified. I mean, imagine that for a moment. Elite troops that are trained, that are supposed to be bold, they will be terrified. These troops were trained in warfare in their terrain. Now, God is not saying here that a nation shouldn't have an organized and powerful military. What he's saying here is that in Edom's case, it wrongly misplaced its trust in its military might. As we look at our nation, we have a powerful military presence. Our history is decorated. Our technology is great. Yet our ultimate trust should not be in our own power, our own military power. 
we can go through and we don't have the time to do it, but, but very quickly we could go back just in a synopsis and, and, and think about how God worked in the Old Testament. I mean, think about Gideon's day. He took 300 men to defeat 135,000 plus. When that happens, who gets the glory? God. Think about Jericho when the people came into the land. Did God say, I'm going to surround you with great weaponry. I'm going to give you everything you need. What did he say? March around the city for six days one time. On the seventh day, march around seven times and shout. And they won. I mean, think about the time uh, in Jehoshaphat's day when God told them, I believe it may have been the Amalekites or one of those groups, he said, what I want you to do is to just go out and sing and the people will turn against themselves. Even in the book of Revelation chapter 19, while there'll be a vast army that will follow the Lord from the heavens, it's not the army that's going to accomplish it, it's the sword that protrudes from the mouth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What does that tell us? We need God. We need God. Edom depended upon its military strength. But I want you to see a third thing. Edom depended upon its allies, its friends. Notice verse 7. Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. That's human nature, isn't it? We think we have a friend, and the friend will turn on us. But then it says, even at the end of, of verse 7, those who eat your bread will set a trap for you. Even those that you have blessed, that you have provided for, that you would feel would be indebted to you, they're going to turn against you. Some have suggested that shortly after this prophecy, the Arabs turned against them, and that's the fall about which God has spoken. We don't know for sure, but we do know in verse 1, in speaking the prophecy against Edom, God says, an envoy has been sent among the nations, rise up and let us go to war against her. And I'm most certain that at least part of that envoy included allies. You know, there's a cry among many people today for the United States. Let's not act alone. We need our allies. We must have strength in numbers. We've got to consolidate with European nations. We've got to, we've got to form a consensus of a number of nations. Don't buy the lie. We see Edom's mistake here was it began to trust in the allies that it had. It began to trust in those they made treaties with. Let me share a truth with you. What we as the United States need are not more allies. We need God. It's not that we need to depend on other people in developing a world uniformity in thought. It's that we need to be more concerned with what God thinks about us as a nation. Edom depended upon its allies, and verse 7 said they would turn against you. But I want you to see a fourth thing. Edom depended upon its wisdom. I was watching um, uh, TV yesterday, and I saw this commercial, and it was a technology commercial that was way above my head. And I'll be honest, the first thing, the first emotion I had was fear. I thought, man, they can do anything these days. Anything. You know, different places are renowned for certain attributes. If I mention Las Vegas, you'll think gambling. If I mention New Orleans, you'll think partying. I used to live in Fort Worth, which was right near Dallas, and Fort Worth was considered a cow town. Dallas was considered a, a banking center. When, when we mention various places, we think of something that may be attributed to it. Edom and Teman as a city, was known as a place of wisdom. In fact, Eliphaz, one of Job's counselors, the one of the individuals that was giving Job counsel, was a Temanite. He was from Edom. God says here, though, he says, I will eliminate, I will eliminate the wise ones of Edom, those who understand from the hill country of Esau. There are many people today that need to say, trust the science, and I respect science, 
That's why you will see me wear a mask here when I'm not speaking as much as I can. I respect it, but I don't trust it. How can I trust something that may refute itself a month or two later? Science, I I remember there's been a time in my life when they said eggs are the worst thing you can eat, then they said eggs are the best thing you can eat, then they said eggs are bad again, and all of those were in the name of science in that time. Now again, I'm not discrediting science, but we're not to trust science. We're to respect it. It's in pursuit of the truth, but we know the one who is true. We're not to place our trust primarily in the wisdom of men. And that doesn't mean we just go off and throw caution to the wind. I'll be honest, because as a Christian, we have a moral mandate in this day in which we live to not be a stumbling block to our brother. We're to think of others. You understand what I'm saying here. But what I'm saying is we're not to be trusting science. We're to trust God. You know, I thought back to an Old Testament illustration as we bring this home. Those were the four things that Edom was trusting in, none of which were God or included God. But I thought of the illustration back in the days of Hezekiah, and you may remember it. Sennacherib was the military leader of Assyria, and he was a mean guy. And he basically came to Hezekiah and the people of Judah, and he said, we will crush you. We're going to crush you. In fact, he was taunting Hezekiah, taunting the people of Judah, taunting the military. And one of the things that Sennacherib said to Hezekiah, he said, and oh, by the way, that Egypt, because Egypt was still around in those days, that you're leaning on like a walking stick is a splintered stick. And you lean on Edom, and it's going to cut your hand and cause your hand to bleed don't lean on it. He was taunting and saying, you think you're going to lean on Egypt. We'll crush Egypt when we crush you. He didn't understand the heart of Hezekiah. Hezekiah went to Isaiah. The first thing was he went to hear the word of God. Does that happen in your life when you go through crisis? Are you driven to the Word of God? When you're tempted to lean on your own understanding of things, do you go to the Word of God? Then later, he received a letter that was increasingly taunting toward him. And you know what Hezekiah did? He took that letter, he went to the house of God, and he laid it before the Lord and said, what? We're helpless. We have to have you. You see, God is no splintered reed, no splintered staff. All of these four areas that we look, they all would let Edom down, but God will not let us down. What was Edom's ultimate sin? Arrogance. We all hate arrogance in other people, don't we? I've done a study on this. The people that are most offended by proud people themselves are proud. I learned that very early in the game of basketball. You bring somebody new in that thinks he's something, and the guy that thinks he's the king of the hill, he's the one that's most upset about it. We hate arrogance in other people. How was Edom's arrogance manifested? Listen in this. They conducted themselves as if God didn't exist. They had a declaration of independence from God. And here's where the message hits home. It's easy for us to say, boy, Adam did wrong. We can see how God would judge them. In fact, in verses 5 and 6, he said, if thieves came to steal, wouldn't they live a little bit? He said, if, if those who would invade your field or those who would inv- invade your grapevines, wouldn't they at least leave a few gleanings? He said, but that won't be the case for you, Esau. You're going to be totally ransacked. It's easy to point at Edom. I'll be honest, it's easy to read this and see the United States. I I see a lot of the same things Edom depended on that we are depending on. But it's even more difficult, though, to say, God, what are you saying to me about this? You see, we as Christians ought to know more than anything what's a splintered reed or a splintered staff and what's not. And I want to ask you this question, and this is really all of it coming in a nutshell. 
If we as the church are not depending upon God and demonstrating that, then how can we expect the nation to do this? So what must we do? We must make an honest evaluation of our lives. In the Old Testament, God sent the prophets really for two primary things. He sent them when their doom was inevitable to speak that doom. That's the case we see here. See here Edom, their doom was already determined. There was no condition. But we also see in the next book of the Bible, Jonah, where for that generation, God sent the prophet Jonah, reluctant as he might be, with a message to call Nineveh to repent. In other words, for Edom, God said, your fate is secure. But for Nineveh, he was saying, you have a chance. You have a chance. So as we understand the book of Obadiah for ourselves, I believe we're more like the people of Nineveh in Jonah's day. God is speaking to us that there's an opportunity, but we must make an honest evaluation of our lives. God, am I truly depending on you, or am I depending on a political party? Am I truly depending on you, or am I depending upon my 401k? Am I truly depending upon you, or am I depending upon my educational abilities? We must honestly evaluate. And then we must have a holy discomfort. Every major movement or spiritual awakening of God comes is preceded by a holy discomfort. What does that mean? An unsettling. God, spiritually, I'm not where I need to be. It's easy for me to look back at Edom and see their transgressions. It's easy for me to sort of parallel and look at these United States. But God, as I look at the truth, I'm not being an example as a Christian. We're not experiencing a vast revival now because we've not experienced first a holy discomfort. Is there an area in your life God's speaking to you about? An area where you've placed your trust that is wrong? People need to see that we trust God. In this day of just disorientation, discombobulation, when everybody is, is frantic, they need to see genuine Christians who are placing their trust in the Lord. But then there's a third thing. We must act in response to what God is calling us to do, in response to in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's calling us today to obedience, radical obedience to fervent prayer. You see, Edom's doom was sure. Ours is not. God has given us the blessing to learn from their transgressions. And so, just as Nineveh had the opportunity to respond, we have an opportunity personally to respond today. God, I hear what you said to Edom. God, I see how you're speaking to me individually. I want to be a light in this world. God, I, I may not be able to fix this whole country, but Lord, in my life, I want to be a person who's leaning on you. Let's pray. Father, if there be any here today who would respond, Lord, some today, maybe they have never trusted Jesus Christ. I pray you would stir their hearts today to say, I want to lean on Jesus. I want to follow him. Lord, we confess that in this Christian life, as we live in, in relationship with you for years, many times we can go through dry seasons. Many times we can begin to depend on human things, our own abilities, our own securities. Lord, forgive us. We thank you, Lord, for the times when you give us that holy discomfort. Help us to respond. Lord, we may not be able to fix this world. We may not be able to fix this virus. We may not be able to fix this nation. But, Lord, you've called us to fix our situation. And that only comes when we trust you, Lord, to fix it. And so, Lord, speak this hour, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to